Um, my topic is uh, from littered canals to vibrant community, witnessing Alapi's obstacle course of waste management. First off, I'm Caitlin Weisbrod. Um, I'm a student at the University of Iowa studying journalism and environmental science as well as sustainability. Um, I first studied abroad in Kerala um, on the University of Iowa's India Winter Program. So I was there for three weeks in uh, over the 2018 New Year. And um, this year I was a Pulitzer Center student fellow, so I decided to go back to the region that I had studied abroad in. Um, Kerala is located on the southern tip of India on the uh, west side. <laughs> Um, and I went to Alapi, which is just uh, a few miles, or I guess 30 miles south of um, Kochi, uh, which is one of the big cities in Kerala. Uh, my original pitch to the Pulitzer Center kind of uh, looked at Alapi, which is a canal community with virtually no waste management services. Um, it's, a, it's a tourist town situated between uh, the, the lake, Vembanad Lake, which is a very large lake in uh, India, um, and the Arabian Sea. So um, this causes a challenge with a high water table for uh, s dealing with sewage and uh, waste in the community. Um, I wanted to integrate 2018 flooding because as I was developing this pitch, a, there was massive flooding in Kerala that was um, very devastating to the community. Um, I figured this had affected Alapi um, and then climate change is often behind these uh, drastic floods. So I figured that these were all kind of at play, waste management, flooding, and climate change. Some history about Alapi, um, it was originally a port connecting international traders on the Arabian Sea to inland markets. Uh, they built these um, networks of canals to connect the community, um, you know, facilitate this trade. So. As the country developed, they decided to construct roads and no longer use the canals. Um, and these roads were built virtually on top of the canals. So they were poorly engineered, um, built quickly, <laughs> and which led to a lot of problems that are kind of manifesting today. So I decided to profile a pilot project that I was aware of to um, clean up the canals. They've now become a site. They virtually have no use. Um, they be, have become a site for depositing garbage and sewage, uh, which leads it all straight to um, the lake itself or to the ocean itself, uh, which is a huge uh, environmental issue in the state. Um, so this pilot project looked to clean up the canals uh, two miles worth at, the, you know, at its initial stage. This cost 1.5 million rupees, uh, which is about around $21,000. Uh, there were several groups working together to do this project um, listed here. I, I dealt with people from all these groups, but they focused on three hotspots, um, areas that waste was coming from most prolifically, uh, which involved a church, a catering company, and the Chatanag colony, which I'll get into. Um, but this was cle completed in February, which um, was right before I showed up. And the, the main goal of the project was not only to rejuvenate the canals, but to revitalize the community itself. Uh, the Chatanag colony became my focus. This is home to 52 families in uh, Kerala. It would be considered a slum by most standards. Um, the canal ran through the backyards of these 52 homes. Um, their, their toilets deposited right into the canal. When the monsoons came, the canal flooded and it went into their homes. This water um, polluted with sewage and garbage. They also had no, no areas to wash themselves, um, wash their pots and pans, um, virtually no um, plumbing or infrastructure for basic human needs. Um, well water tests done by the groups um, initiating this pilot project showed that 83% of well water contained E. coli. Um, one of the solutions that these groups came up with was to deal with the sewage. You had, they, they couldn't do it underground like we do here in the US. So they built a aerobic digester, um, which is when septic waste is pumped. This is the only an energy intensive part of the, the, part of the equation. Um, they pump the waste into this big chamber. The one on the, um, on the bottom is the, is the first chamber where uh, bacteria works to decompose the contaminants. Um, after this step, it's already 80% treated. In the second chamber, you can see all those flowers in the top picture. Um, the water flows through the bed of flowers, through the roots, and this naturally filters out the remaining waste. Um, the clean water is then drained into the canal. 
Um, and the project also provided um, these basic necessities for all the families, toilets, wash areas, and bathing areas, um, covered the canal. You know, this, this top photo is the what was once the canal is now covered and um, people can grow herbs back there, children play back there, it's, it's safe now. Um, and the wastewater drains into the aerobic digester from, all, from the toilets, wash areas, and bathing areas. And a big theme of this was also making sure that the community was, um, that the people in the community were a priority, that they were, their needs were met, they weren't ignored as they have been in many government, government projects. Um, this came in the form of murals, aesthetic changes, um, and in the future they want to do more of that, more um, flowers, more um, lighting, public art, things like that, just creating a more, a, just a better community overall for everybody. Um, Lathar Raymond, one of my sources, said it best, at the end of the day, it's a small change. It's a small difference, but it can make a big change in how people perceive their environment. Um, they'll treat the canals better in this beautified community. My story changed a lot from my initial pitch, <laughs> as I'm sure all of yours did. Uh, the climate and flooding connection that I wanted to start with was unsubstantiated, uh, so I did not go with it. My focus shifted to the people in the Chapinag colony um, and the people working on this project. A major challenge <laughs> that I ran into was the translation. Most folks do speak English in India, but um, a lot of the people in Chattanooga Colony did not. Uh, my translator was a member of one of the groups involved, so I think he was trying to get me good quotes. <laughs> and so he kind of translated things to fit my story, and I realized when I got back to the US that some of my translations that I got in the field weren't as accurate. Um, they also lacked intimacy. It was hard for me to get familiar with the people in the community with that language barrier. Um, but I, I was really happy with my final product. My focus was on these people, on this community, and on the solutions to them and how they are viewing their, they, it, happiness was a theme between all these people. Um, they're all photographed here, the, the folks I talked to in the community. They were really happy with the changes. Um, one of the, the folks involved said, compared it to the United States in a way that made it make sense for me. Um, these people don't even know what happens to their waste. We don't know what happens to our waste. You know, most people don't think about when you flush a toilet, as he says in this quote, when you flush a toilet, it goes into a sewer, it gets treated, ends up in a water body. But if you're born into that, you know how to use it. Someone who's born here in Kerala does not know anything else. Um, when they're communicating with people about how you need to keep the canals clean, how you need to deal with your garbage, you can't just throw it in the, in the canal, um, they're creating a systemic awareness that was not originally there. So that was an enormous change in the community and it's being received well. Thank you. So my name is Audrey Fromson. I am a third year undergraduate student at the University of Chicago. And this summer I spent about five weeks recording in Huaraz, Peru, which is an eight hour bus ride, car ride uh, north of Lima in the Cordillera Blanca mountain range, which is the second highest mountain range next to the Himalayas. And this is a story of the threat of an Andean flood in a city that lies in its wake. Uh, above Huaraz, about 14 miles up, is a lake called Laguna Palcacocha or Lake Palcacocha and it flooded in 1941 and was on the brink of flooding um, all through the 20th century and this is the story of how um, the city and government foreign agencies um, are trying to mitigate that danger and to start off i'm going to kind of locate us in that story with the sights and sounds um, with a short video and then kind of unpack that and discuss um, some of the stories within that bigger context
So thanks for watching that short video. I feel like to gain context of what this story means and the scale of everything, it's just helpful to get those visuals and like especially hearing the sound in the siphons um, is it just kind of grounds us. So this is a photo of Laguna Palcacocha. Um, it looks quite extraordinary. A lot of mountain lakes in Peru have this really um, vibrant blue and that's because they reflect the glacial ice um, and the brown area um, on the outside of the lake used to be snow covered and this is not unique to Peru this is happening in Nepal and the Himalayas this is happening in parts of the Alps and what really made me interested in this story was that I've heard of glacial melt um, and I hadn't really heard about how they were affecting lakes and I especially hadn't heard about how they were affecting communities below them and um, as I mentioned these siphons which are about like this large in diameter they're kind of like this plasticky hard they're meant to be temporary um, and they haven't been replaced which is um, something I'll talk about um, these siphons are meant to keep the level of the lake stagnant however that doesn't prevent pieces of glacier from falling off due to warming temperatures mixed with the fact that um, Juarez is on a, a seismic zone so there could be an earthquake and a piece of glacier could fall off therefore causing a flood and what I noticed mostly, like my big takeaway, as I mentioned in the video, was that even though monitoring stations like this exist, um, and foreign and Peruvian uh, agencies, whether they be governments or like private research institutions, are trying to mitigate, there are a lot of forces who aren't. Um, and what often happens is that monitoring sites like this conflict with indigenous communities in the area. This isn't the case in Huaraz in particular, um, but in some cases there have been indigenous communities tearing down monitoring sites around different lakes, which mirrors this whole lack of communication because of lack of consensus among the people in power. And then there's no trust because there's no communication. And this totally mirrors um, effects of colonialism that have ruled over Peru and still are very much seeped into the culture today. These, um, this is just a photograph of the hut where the guards sleep over Pacacocha. So on one hand, these guards absolutely represent the people ter in terms of class and socioeconomic status, represent the people who are local, but also have access to all of this research. And they represent sort of these local educators. And they're the ones who are saying there's just not enough being done in terms to educate people because the power is really being concentrated. And this is Gabino and um, on the right hand side and his son Clinton um, and this was the farmer that I interviewed and his son. This is about three hours away from Huaraz. It's 
a van, a car ride, and a one hour hike up a mountain to get there. And I, this is just kind of like a story behind the story because we're in a room of journalists. Um, Clinton in the center actually worked at my hostel that I was staying at um, in Juarez. And I realized the more this story was sort of like taking over my psyche, I was sort of talking to everybody about it. Um, and I always let them approach me and if they wanted to ask and it wasn't a scheduled interview and he told me my father's a farmer we're losing money why don't you come and talk to him and this is the reservoir they've built because there's such lack of action on the government's part people really have to take it into their own hands in order to conserve water and in terms of resistance or holding people accountable this is Sayul Yuya um, he's a farmer and also a mountain guide who lives in Huaraz and he is suing a German energy company called RWE for their role in climate change. There's a database of the top 100 carbon producers in the world, and he, uh, he, RWE is one of those producers. So he's working with um, a, an agency in Germany called German Watch and trying to hold them accountable. Um, so this story has people who are you know, attacking the people in power, but because the power and knowledge about who those people are is so concentrated, it's really hard to get to the crux of the issue. And um, some takeaways um, that I had about my own reporting was like similarly to all of you, um, that there's always more to be told. There's like food stories in here, there's public health issues. I had a taxi driver talk to me about his son being born with respiratory issues because of the air pollution. Um, and also trying to take care of yourself as a reporter. These stories are really heavy and I find that this type of weekend is really um, beneficial so that we can all learn about what it's like to have to share them out. Um, and before I end, I just wanna thank the Pulitzer Center and National Geographic um, and all of you for your time. Uh, this has been a tremendous experience, so thank you. Thanks for sticking with us for the climate section. <laughs> it's important. Um, my name is Emma Johnson. I'm a master's student at the Yale School of Forestry, and I spent three weeks this summer in Bhutan uh, reporting on the future of their hydropower system in a changing climate. And mostly when you hear stories about Bhutan, you may think of idyllic nature. They coined the term gross national happiness. That's a lot of what people talk about, but <coughs> Bhutan is really part of this larger system of energy use and international relations in South Asia. Um, in South Asia overall, there's 5,000 large hydropower dams, thousands more small ones, and Bhutan is a big part of uh, this story about energy use and a changing climate. Um, so to get you situated, Bhutan is bordered by Tibet to the north and India to the south. This is a really strategic place. Bhutan is a tiny kingdom, population total of 750,000. Um, and so they play a really actual critical peacekeeping role to help keep, keep tensions down between India and China. And Bhutan is classified as the least developed country under the UN, but uh, the entire country, but especially Timpu, the capital you see here, which is a city of 115,000, has developed extensively in recent decades. And Bhutan is expected to graduate from the LDC category in uh, 2023. And hydropower provides much of the revenue that's needed to uh, support this development. And in many ways, Bhutan is really well suited to hydropower. This is what a lot of the country looks like, steep mountains descending into a winding river valley, which is like naturally driven to uh, extracting energy from water. So it was a natural choice uh, for Bhutan to look to hydropower. Um, this is a map that shows the major rivers in Bhutan and the current hydropower project. Um, these rivers are really critical, even though you might think that there's not that many. All of these rivers will eventually go to join with the Brahmaputra, which is a river that sustains millions of people, and the rivers originate here in Bhutan. So thinking about the impact that these rivers have for just life across South Asia is really important. Um, so the dots in green that you can see are the power plant, uh, the hydropower plants that are currently in operation. Um, they contribute to 20% of Bhutan's GDP and 35% of revenues to the government, so they're incredibly important. Um, the, Dots in red are the projects under construction. Um, and all of these projects are run of the river schemes, uh, which means that they cannot store water behind them. Rather, the water must be immediately uh, directed into an intake tunnel, which spins the turbines, or the water must flow through the dam gates ungenerated. So if you're familiar with like the Hoover Dam and things that are big reservoirs, this is not what those look like. 
And so that this means that uh, generation in Bhutan is very seasonal. Um, in the winter, the glaciers are frozen and there isn't a lot of rain, so the rivers run really low. But in the summer, the glaciers melt and there's big monsoons from India, so there are intense downpours that flood the rivers. So this makes generation very variable over the, over the seasons. And the two dots in purple that you can see are two big reservoir projects that have been cited but not yet started. So I was in Bhutan in 2017 for a year working for a program called the School for Field Studies. So this is where I like gained a lot of this knowledge. And so coming back this time, I really used this opportunity to travel to a lot of the different hydropower uh, plants to learn how they're run and operated. Um, so this is Kurichu, a plant in eastern Bhutan. Um, and at this plant, they produce 60 megawatts of electricity in the summer, but only 16 megawatts in the winter. Um, and so across Bhutan, in the winter, Bhutan barely makes enough to supply its own electricity, and sometimes um, they actually must buy some back. Um, but in the peak generation of summer, it uses about 30% across the whole country and sells the rest. And so when you're thinking about where you're selling electricity to, in a lot of ways, geography determines trade. So the top is a picture of the uh, Bhutan's with Tibet. Um, looks pretty inhospitable and uh, hard to cross. So uh, Bhutan has almost no diplomatic relations with China. The bottom is the border with India, which is actually tropical plains and uh, really, excuse me, suitable for trade. Um, and so Bhutan uh, mostly deals with India in all aspects of their life. Um, Bhutan and India have a 50 year diplomatic relationship. It was India who helped Bhutan enter the modern world in the 1960s. They also contribute to Bhutan's budget every year, the government budget. And all of two of the hydropower projects are happening because of Indian investment. Um, and through a mix of loans and grants, India has helped Bhutan develop, but has also pulled them deeply into debt, which beholdens Bhutan to a lot of India's wishes in a lot of ways. And India gets to control both the price and the market of all of their electricity, because as uh, Bhutan's only southern neighbor, they get to, all of the electric lines must go through India first before uh, going anywhere else. But of course, all of this is happening under climate change. Um, Climate change is expected to have uh, many impacts, far more than its fair share, considering it is one of the world's few carbon negative countries. Um, and, but as one environment officer told me, carbon has no border. Um, so this map shows a section of Bhutan's glaciers in 2010. And in 1980, these glaciers covered those blue green lake areas you see. And so rapid melting is increasing the race, rate of flooding, um, which can have devastating effects. And if current warming continues, one third of all Himalayan glaciers are expected to melt by uh, the end of the century. So this is a huge impact. And um, while you may think more water may be good for hydropower because of the run of the river systems, um, if more flooding happens in the summer when dams are already at, at past capacity, really, that it just means that more water goes through the dams ungenerated. So they actually cannot generate more electricity because of this. And when I asked people, what can Bhutan do to mitigate climate change? They usually gave me answers that weren't scientific related at all. But and, um, one professor told me supporting the private sector was one thing that Bhutan could really do to strengthen its own capacity to adapt to changes. So flooding events are already regular occurrences. Um, this is a picture of a massive flash flood that happened a day before I arrived in the area. Um, my guide and I walked out to the site because the road that I was supposed to be traveling on was flooded. Um, so this pushed boulders down the mountain and destroyed a bridge. Um, it, at the junction with the river below, it tore into a storehouse of Indian hydropower equipment. It killed four people. And this is just one example of many flash floods that are happening more and more because of climate change. And so one way that Bhutan is going to adapt to some of these climate challenges is through reservoirs. So only two possible sites for reservoirs have been cited in the country, which are those two purple dots I showed earlier. This is a picture of the Bakra Dam in India, so the ones in Bhutan haven't started yet. But thinking about um, Bhutan deeply investing into these projects, which are going to cost billions of dollars, and in the end just lead to more inflexible infrastructure is a big choice that they're going to make. But for them, it makes a lot of sense because this means they can control the generation all year long. Um, but thinking about how they can support, um, like ways that Bhutan can think about uh, supporting technological and professional capacity outside of the hydropower sector will be really important. So I just want to end with leaving you some quotes for my interviewees. On the left side there is Zongpo, the chief uh, engineer at the Kurichu plant. Um, 
who says, oh, we don't have the market in Bhutan to need have a strong grid, we need to depend on India. And in the middle, Che Wang Rinzen, managing director of the Drew Green Power Corporation. Uh, while we like to talk about diversification, we should not forget that any diversification work that you do will need electricity from hydropower. We will not slow down in the way we are constructing hydropower projects. And last from Tenzin Wangmo there on the right, the chief climate officer, she says the whole economy is dependent on hydropower. We are making such a huge investment in it, but if in 30 years this water dries up, what do we do? And so I wanted to just end with my project page there. And my uh, multimedia component was a story map, which is a program built by Esri to like do interactive maps, videos, text. These maps I made uh, are part of that. So I would encourage taking a picture, writing that link down, and checking that out, because it's a really interactive way to look at my story. Thank you. hanging in there um, okay so I'll just get right into it um, my story was about the 2018 heat wave that affected much of Northeast Asia particularly Japan so um, basically the heat was bad uh, it is you know the human cost of life was pretty significant there was a lot of human suffering records were broken uh, unfortunately heat waves uh, extreme weather events are not that uncommon these days um, the incremental march of climate change is making catastrophic weather events much more normal. Normalized doesn't diminish that suffering, of course, but uh, record-breaking events happening all the time kind of hide the milestones and the barriers that get crossed uh, as these storms and these events get much more severe. So my story is, yes, about the 2018 Japan heat wave. I'll take you there, explain it. Um, but I'm also, there's a new kind of type of science that's been around for about eight years called attribution science. And this type of science is examining data using computer models to be able to track these milestones, these subtle changes. And um, the 2018 Japan heat wave really was a big step forward um, in a historic sense, in a kind of philosophical sense uh, about a new era of the earth that we are entering. So I'll take you back there. Um, like I said, it was very hot. So this is the map of Japan, more or less. Um, each of those little squares represents a weather station. Uh, this is from July 15th, 2018. Um, every single little square that has a bolded arrow on it is the hottest ever temperature recorded at that square. So um, on this day, 200 of the 927 weather stations in Japan was above 35 degrees Celsius, which is about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and 35C used to be kind of as hot as Japan would ever get in the summer. So the human costs were pretty severe. Um, Japan is a country that does not generally have that much air conditioning. It's definitely changing now. So during the heat wave last summer, um, there were more than 70,000 hospitalizations due to heat stroke, heat stress, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the official count for deaths was 1,032. Um, air conditioning hit a five-year, or I'm sorry, the price of electricity hit a five-year high. Um, their electricity companies offer discounts to senior citizens as a lot of them do not have air conditioning are more susceptible to heat stress. Um, July 17th to, to July 23rd, which was the kind of peak of the heat wave, um, the Tokyo Fire Department took more than 3,000 people to the hospital for heat stress related events every single day. There were government warnings uh, and uh, after a six year old child died due to heat stress at like a school summer sports event, which is very traditional in Japan, um, a lot of these events were canceled. So the hottest day of the year was July 23rd. Uh, if you can see just above Tokyo, um, that is called a little suburb city, about 200,000 people called Kumagaya. It hit 41.1 degrees Celsius, 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that is the hottest temperature ever recorded in the history of Japan since they've been keeping stuff. So um, I traveled to Kumagaya. Uh, I wanted to go see the town where this was, where this occurred, talk to people that were there. So I spoke to Kyoko-san, this 82-year-old uh, woman who, this is her little farm. Um, Japan is formerly a very big agricultural uh, country and a lot of the older folks have these little farms that they work at. Um, she told me that yes, it's gotten much hotter. Um, she can't grow the same crop she used to. She cannot work in the summers during the heat of the day. She gets too tired. Um, I also spoke to a guy by the name of Kazuo Osakamaki who actually lived across the street from the weather station that recorded this th um, temperature. He'd lived there for 76 years. He talked a lot about how, again, yes, this temperature is much, much, much worse than it used to be. The summers are much hotter. Um, he used to not have to worry about AC ever. A yeah, fan would be enough, but now he's got an air conditioning unit in every single room. I spoke to um, the owner of a bike shop, this young guy by the name of Tatsuro Maizawa, 
And um, he quite literally had a regular customer um, stumble into the front of his shop, suffering from heat stroke, and he had to, you know, sit him down, give him water, the whole thing. Uh, but one of the interesting things that uh, when I was talking to uh, Kazuo, the guy, old man who lived across the street from the weather station, is that he's lived through so much. He literally was there the day that the heat record was broken in Japan. He's seen the change, but he didn't, he had some doubts about the connection between this event and climate change. Um, he was, he actually surprised me and brought up the term climate change through my translator. I didn't ask him about it. So uh, a little surprised that, you know, someone who's getting up in their years knew this topic. He mentioned melting ice caps and stuff, but that connection was something that he doubted. Um, well, so I'm going to take you to May 2019, which is about attribution science in the second half of my story. So uh, I studied marine biology in my undergrad. Um, the line I would always hear when we were talking about extreme weather events and climate change was this. We know that climate change is making dr droughts drier, heat waves hotter, everything worse and worse and worse. We can never point to a single event and say, this is caught because of climate change. That's been difficult. So to help me explain uh, how attribution science works, we're gonna talk about baseball real brief. Um, so that's Barry Bonds, if you don't know, home run record king, uh, he also was on steroids the whole time. So in our metaphor, um, CO2 is steroids. Barry Bonds is the climate, a single home run in the distance is a single extreme weather event in the extremity of that event. How do you compare? So the question that attribution science is asking is, was one single home run caused by the steroids? It's actually kind of a hard question to ask, right? Um, well, certainly. Um, yes, you can assume generally, yes, but a single event, why? How do you quantify that? So what you do basically, and I'll do this quickly because of you know, time constraints, is you build a computer model of Barry Bonds without climate change, without steroids. You compare it to the real world measured event. So Barry Bonds can hit 10 home runs on steroids a year that are 450 feet or longer. Um, Barry Bonds without steroids, the model can only hit one. Steroids made that event 10 times more likely. So remember I talked about how the Japan event was a special weather event. Um, if you'll read the headline or I'll read it to you, July 2018 high temperature event event in Japan could not have happened without human induced global warming. This is the equivalent of a 600 yard home, 600 foot home run by Barry Bonds. Um, steroids, yes, made this possible. CO2 made this possible. The world before CO2 could never have produced this heat wave at this temperature. Um, so that's kind of crazy to me. This is a historical shift I was talking about earlier. So Yukiko Imada, the doctor, uh, professor, and lead author of that paper, um, this is what I asked her when I asked her about the historical significance of this. Um, Human activity has made a new phase of the climate. We have left the world that existed before previously impossible weather events, and I do mean that literally, are now not only possible, they are happening, and um, unfortunately they are killing people. There have been five such events in the, so far that have been measured with this effect, um, and the Japan 2018 heat wave was the first one directly attributed to deaths. So what next? That's always a big question when it comes to climate change. Um, I think there's a lot of, kind of intellectual value to this kind of study, and I hope that that knowledge can motivate people to change their actions, but um, First of all, what next is it's gonna get worse. Uh, a lot of people know about the latency period of climate change, even if we stop right now, no more CO2, the world's still gonna get warmer. So I was really interested uh, to ask Japanese people and activists there, what are you doing? Um, well, first of all, uh, adapt. That is the biggest thing. Um, there's simple ways you can adapt. Uh, a lot of people in Japan walk around with umbrellas to stay out of the heats, um, but there's kind of a reality that as it gets hotter, you need more AC. AC uses electricity, so um, there was a lot of acceptance of just climate change is happening, what can we do about it? Not much, let's just go with the flow. But there was a lot of um, action amongst young people. So I was there for um, the, 2000, or the September 20th climate strike. And I spoke to many people that are young and bringing about action, young folks. The biggest move in Japan right now, as I spoke to people who cared about this process, was um, awareness. There's not much discussion of change in Japan. It's hard to change in Japan. So, um, you know, this is another professor who's researching how to, an activist as well. Um, of course, everyone talked about the youth, so I'll just leave you with that. Um, in a world that is changing, changing quickly and changing beyond what was previously possible, um, everyone spoke about, let's keep it well for our children. So, thank you to everyone. Does the water go? That that surprised me too. That they would in Peru, they they have such challenges with water. It was it was bizarre to see them actually draining it. Of course, for a good reason. But yeah.
Um, so thank you. I um, actually went to Palco Cocha twice um, and physically being up there the first time was tricky. Um, I couldn't breathe very well, um, but uh, it was it was Quite literally breathtaking. Um, it was uh, really astonishing, and I sort of describe it as um, like seeing like a what you'd assume to be like it's so gorgeous, and you think like oh it's so healthy, and I didn't know that ice was used to be on the brown part of the mountain until somebody told me, and it's like it's the equivalent of seeing like a really healthy person who you assume to be healthy perhaps by how they look on the outside like hooked up to IVs because it's this gorgeous lake and if you keep sort of blinders on that's all you can see but then you see these monitoring stations and they're building a new hut that has more technology and there's like a pure like a functioning bathroom because people live there um the guards live there full time um so that was like a huge juxtaposition of like this beauty and then this man-made stuff trying to mitigate man-made issues um, and then the water is not really captured. That's like another issue. People are trying to build canals, um, but government money and people not recognizing the issue is making a lot of projects slow going. Um, there's a lot of corruption. That is to say, um, like I mentioned, um, Clinton and his father have built a reservoir to, to conserve water from the mount from, it's a different mountain that they live by. Um, so there are like local efforts um, but large scale, it's a bit harder. It goes into a river basin essentially, but it's not being captured in like a reservoir. Okay, let's see, more questions? You really wanna go to Brass Rebeck? <laughs> Hi, Hannah from Columbia Journalism School. So uh, I wanted to know, because all of you guys have such incredibly like visual pieces naturally, how would you go about making a film about this without, say, just beautifying it and really getting to the serious aspects of it? Or not. <laughs> I had the enormous challenge of the fact that um, it was already cleaned up when I got there. <laughs> so I didn't know how to visually show that it used to be bad and now it's good. And there were probably areas that I didn't go to um, because for other reasons, but um, that do have the issue still that I wasn't able to represent visually. I had to go describe in my, in my writing based on what people had told me and the photos that they had um, from before. So that was something that, that was a challenge for me representing it visually too. Because it was really beautiful, the changes they had made, and I wanted to iterate that it was not like this, and these people were suffering. Um, I guess with my project, like I was there in a actually pretty cool part of time for Japan. Like they had had a pretty bad heat wave earlier in the year, um, so it was a little difficult to capture like the feeling of heat in people, but. Um, the impacts of this were affecting all parts of our lives, so it was easy. Um, I had to really quickly rush through stuff at the end, but um, there was a lot of response to these events. So in Kumagaya, there was um, the government paid to repave some of these roads with this like high reflective concrete that lowered the temperature. So that was a point that was directly following up on these events. Um, I think that's a really cool way to get into it because you can look at you know progress and change and movement versus just capturing an event, which, um, you know, like, again, it's, and it doesn't diminish the value of any of those, the suffering during those events, but they're like almost a dime a dozen now. I think it's like, you really have to look at the motion and progress afterwards, while of course not um, diminishing the value of those, the, the people that lived through those events. I would say that it's difficult. I mean, it is really difficult because a lot of things that people struggle, like also to mentally understand climate change is, just that it's hard to comprehend the time frame that it's happening because it's things, you know, sometimes seem like they're happening slow, but they build up in a way that like can lead to something like catastrophic at the end of it. But it's hard to document that in a film um, unless you were like, you know, for some reason had the fortune to like, you know, be watching, like have the footage of Glacier receding. So I think that is like a significant challenge um, to think about systems. but. Like I think from an anecdotal perspective, like you can talk to a lot of people who can like say personally how climate change has affected them. So, you know, I think a video could go from that point. Like I had a lot of people who told me that they couldn't grow crops that they used to be able to grow that like some seasons really bad. And so like being able to talk to people personally about how that personal effect um, is showing in them could be a way. But from a visual standpoint, I think it's really difficult because if you 
go to Bhutan, it is scenically gorgeous. And so, but that doesn't diminish the fact that climate change is going to have serious and long lasting impacts. So I think that's an incredible challenge. Yeah. So, do we have another question? Um, so my question is for you, Audrey. Um, so you touched on how what's going on in, in the Andes right now are kind of a legacy of colonialism in Peru. And so did you get to see anything about the indigenous people you know, from the pueblos talk about their relationship with the state and how they know best how to take care of their communities? And if you could like talk about it a little bit. Yeah, um, thanks for asking that question. Um, so you mean sort of like, did I talk with the indigenous communities and their, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. So. I was staying in Huaraz, which is a city of about 100,000 people, but there in that same region of Ancash, there are different um, cities. And then once you go into the mountains, that's when you can um, talk to indigenous communities. Um, it's a bit hard sometimes just like the actual communication because some of them do speak Quechua, um, but not always. And, and they're often younger um, younger children or adolescents who, who can translate in Spanish. And the government is such that um, it's like, like many governments, it's complicated and corrupt, and there's sort of this um, pointing fingers action that happens. So, like, it's very bureaucratic. And that I talked to people, um, sorry, it's like a bit, it's, it's just so complicated, like, how to start. But I guess, like, some of the questions, I guess, like, the central questions lie in, like, whose land is this or whose lake is this? So, in order to answer that question, you have to talk to people who have been there for quite literally, like, forever. And then also perhaps now it's part of Huascara National Park, which Pacacocha is. And then the park is trying to figure out what to do with the indigenous communities. Um, and can they let their cattle like roam into the land? Like there's all of these nuances of culture that the government is not always aware of. And like, I think sometimes pass off as ignorance. That is to say that I did talk to a lot of people at like the park uh, agency who are, um, responsive to those concerns however when they like to concern the indigenous people and they are officially under the government this park agency but then they say we don't have the jurisdiction to do this we can't we don't have we have the proposals like i talked to an expert who has a proposal um to mitigate uh like he thinks that the lake should be lowered even even more and he said i have plans and he showed me in his office i have this scroll this is the plan but the government won't take it because of money um, and I talked to government agencies and I talked to like people pretty high up in regional government and their response was, that's not in my jurisdiction. And yeah, I'm the same face as you. <laughs> and so, um, a lot of talk, yeah. Well, I think we're going to have to end there because I don't want to out where our welcome at Nat Geo, <laughs> but I want to just say thank you to this panel and to the fabulous. And before you leave, just a couple of things that I want to say. I want to thank all of the 2019 reporting fellows. And it was a tremendous weekend with fantastic presentations. And you outdid yourself. And I feel very proud. And.